Brian uh, Dosette, University of Waterloo. Hey, Brian. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Brian Doucette, and I'm a Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor in the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. I'm here as an ally and in support of ACORN today. I've studied housing for more than 15 years and currently hold five uh, research grants funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, including a project on neighbourhood change here in Hamilton and an investigation of displacement and eviction along Waterloo's LRT corridor. I recently published a report about change already taking place along Hamilton's LRT corridor, and just today in the conversation I published an article uh, that outlines some of the concerns that I have and some of the ideas around why an anti-rent eviction bylaw is so important. All this research has led me to one very clear conclusion. The most effective measure a municipality can implement to address the housing affordability crisis is to enact bylaws to make rent evictions so unappealing to landlords that they stop this unjust and cruel process. We talk a lot today about a housing crisis, and we talk so much about building new housing that we lose sight of the already existing housing, affordable housing, that is being lost in plain sight. While we have very little data on this, one statistic stands out. For every new unit of affordable housing built in Hamilton, 29 are lost to processes such as rent evictions. That's at least 10,000 units where the rent was $750 a month or less that are now gone. To be clear, many of these units still exist. They're just much more expensive as landlords have evicted their sitting tenants in order to dramatically raise rents to maximize their profit, regardless of the human cost. We actually have very little statistical data on rent evictions and displacement. The census doesn't track them. And for some planners, policymakers, and politicians, this lack of data means there isn't a problem. What you are hearing today is your data. It is your evidence. It is also the tip of the iceberg. We've heard stories in our research in Hamilton and in our research in Waterloo that echo what you're hearing today. Yes, the provincial government should do more, but they will not. Bill 97 does not constitute a significant improvement for tenants. The onus still clearly falls on tenants to exercise their legal right to return. But as you're hearing today, tenants are exhausted. They are exhausted because they're fighting with landlords who want them gone simply because they can charge more rent to someone else. Furthermore, Bill 97 places responsibility for finding temporary accommodation squarely on the tenant being rent evicted, not the landlord evicting them. This is what made New Westminster's bylaw so effective. It shifted responsibility from the tenant to the landlord. And let's be clear, New Westminster's bylaw was so effective that it virtually eliminated rent evictions. That's a really important point that isn't expressed particularly clearly in the, reports, uh, the, the city report that you have in front of you. It also stood up to two court challenges. It wasn't just the steep fines being imposed. Yes, fines are important. But we aren't primarily talking about mom and pop, so-called mom and pop landlords here. We are talking about large, financialized landlords owning hundreds of buildings and thousands of units whose entire business model is predicated on evicting low-income tenants in order to charge much higher rents. I would encourage you to look at my colleague Martine August's work on this, where she's done some excellent and groundbreaking research into shedding light on this. The key element of New Westminster's bylaw was that it, treated la it, it required landlords to provide that temporary accommodation to tenants while their units were being renovated. They couldn't just kick them out and say, get back in touch when all the renovations are done. That shifted power relations and completely disrupted a business model based on profit by dispossession. Hamilton, you must do something similar. Your city is rapidly losing affordable housing and the provincial government won't help. The federal government won't help. 
If City Council wants Hamilton to be a city that is affordable to everyone, it has no, chance, no choice to act and act boldly. The city's report suggests this is not within its remit. However, ACORN's legal advice clearly suggests otherwise. It also notes that an anti-brand eviction bylaw here would not be precedent setting, but would rather instead follow the path of other cities across the country that have acted well within the remit while still taking decisive action to address urgent and pressing challenges. You have already declared a homeless emergency in the city. My question to you is this. Where do you think people who are rent evicted and have nowhere else to go end up? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, we do have a councillor who wishes to ask questions too now. Councillor Nan is first, please. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your delegation and for being here today. Um, I, I want to emphasize the point about data and uh, what we measure and what we don't. And it's been a challenge over the last almost five years on this file of trying to get accurate data. Um, the, the consultant's report that's before us identifies how in other municipalities they're tracking rent evictions. Uh, from your experience um, in field of expertise, what what would you recommend as being data sources? And how do you think we could go about measuring it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, Steve Pomeroy has done some really good work, and that's where the numbers that I've pulled uh, have come from. So I think he's got some really good ways of looking at some of the, the housing data. But I would also say that you can't just rely on statistics. Mm -hmm. Statistics are great. The census is great. It tells us a lot of things. But there's so much of what's happening in our cities and in our, housing, uh, in, our, in our housing crisis that simply does not show up in, uh, in, in, in the, the census. And so what you're hearing today, mm -hmm. that is the evidence, that is the data. And it's not about numbers, it's about stories, but it's also about shifting from an individual story, an individual anecdote, to actually seeing that this is part of a, a, a wider pattern. Everything that's been said today is, is things that we hear all the time in our research. Um, so it's also about thinking about what is data, thinking about we need to hear people's stories and that counts just as much as any data set or number. Because people who are displaced by their very nature sort of disappear. And so I've not come across a data set anywhere that can really accurately capture the full extent of rent evictions, of displacement, even evictions because some of this happens without going to court, right? Um, let alone the emotional toll mm -hmm. that it takes. Thank you for that response. I really do appreciate it. Um, there has been some dialogue among uh, some folks at the, and I would say on the bureaucracy side, of uh, the uh, Ontario uh, Tenant Board, uh, where they've been pushing for digitization and modernization of data collection and in an effort to be able to share that information in terms of the number of N13s that are filed or the number of N12s that are filed within a municipality. Um, the city of Kitchener, I believe, is tracking rent evictions. I'm not sure how they're going about doing so, um, but it's fascinating to me and it's interesting to me. I heed your advice that lived experience ought to be valued as a data source, period. I 100% there with you. Um, but there is also a necessity for us to continue to track and measure the outcomes of what this body does and what this municipality does. Uh, so I guess I'll follow up with you offline uh, to get some more information about the sources that you've outlined and also any other further recommendations you might have. Yeah. If I could add one Please. very quick point yes. to that. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about bylaw and we've heard a lot of talk about the, the ways in which bylaw officers haven't responded. I mean, some of that data and actually following up on that, that's a very important source of, of, of information and data, right? So what kind of bylaw complaints are being made? Um, are they being followed up? Are there, is there action taken to protect tenants' rights? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Don't go away. You're a popular guy. <laughs> um, Councillor Maureen Wilson, please. You had indicated you wish to speak also. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Doucette. Um, you just answered or touched on um, my point and my colleague was um, delving into, and that is sometimes the lack of congruency between census data and what that actually is happening, in, happening on the ground and um, your study, the, the importance of actually being on the ground. And I love the idea of um, looking at our own um, public sector workers, using them as, as, as field officers in, in gaining that evidence and that data. So it's something for, for me to note, thank you. Um, you started your delegation by stating um, the city should enact bylaws, and you were plural in that to make renovations um, unappealing. And I, didn't, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you could unpack that. I, I wanted to know whether you were speaking, if you could identify um, more than just uh, a model uh, such as New Westminster, if, you, if that's what you were uh, implying. Thank you through the chair. Thank you, doctor, please. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it takes more than one bylaw. So having the, uh, the landlord registry, right? And then having fines and regulations and uh, um, things like New Westminster did to shift that onus from landlords, uh, or from, from tenants to landlords, uh, I think is very important. There's other things, I mean, if we're, if, again, if we're talking about protecting the existing rental housing stock that already exists, there are things like rental replacement bylaws that are essential, mm -hmm. um, that are just as essential as uh, rent evictions, because when buildings are demolished, that's where some of those units are lost as well. So having tenants have the ability to return into a new development on the site of where their apartments were at the same rent and the same type of units. Bill 97 makes that a little bit more complicated, uh, but Toronto and Mississauga had embarked on that, and we were pushing with, with folks at the city of Kitchener to, uh, you know, based on some of the work that we were doing, and they're now looking into it. I mean, they're gonna spend some time looking into it, but uh, that's another thing that is essential to, to this piece of the puzzle. Councillor. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kretsch, please. Hi, thank you so much. I've had a chance only to skim the article you uh, wrote for the conversation. I haven't had a chance to, to read the whole thing, but I read fast. And so um, I appreciate you mentioning talking about dental evictions essentially is what you're speaking to and you bring up Bill 97. So the first question I have is about Bill 97 and the second one is a question I've asked a couple of other people that I thought would be, be great to have your thoughts on. So uh, Bill 97 is proposing some changes, um, but it's still not going as far as the Residential Tenancy Act in BC. And if I understand it correctly, and you may also, um, you know, at one point there was, uh, you know, a notice given to tenants in BC, and it was like, hey, um, we want to renovate uh, you from this unit. Essentially, here's your notice of eviction. We're going to renovate, and now an order must be sought from their version of the landlord tenant board. Um, so I wonder if you could just unpack this kind of the distance, right, that we have to travel here. How the provincial legislation leaves a gap for the municipality. Yeah, doctor. Um, thanks for that. So we're still unpacking what Bill 97 means because it was dropped right before the Easter weekend and there's a lot in it. But from my understanding, it still places the onus of responsibility on the tenant. And the, the duty of care from the landlord that made New Westminster's anti-rent eviction bylaw so successful is not part of Bill 97, despite the name, protecting tenants somewhere <laughs> in that title, um, it still is on the, th there's more time, right, there, for, for tenants, there's a bit more uh, opportunity for them to exercise their rights, but they still have to be proactive and the landlord can basically absolve themselves of any responsibility of ensuring tenants come back. So again, New Westminster's renovation, anti-renovation bylaw disrupted that business model by saying to the landlord, basically, you are responsible for the tenant while the unit is being renovated. And that's, I mean, the whole premise of a rent eviction, as we've heard today, is simply to get a tenant paying below market rent out and not come back. So when you shift that onus, then you disrupt that business model. And there's nothing in Bill 97 that comes close to that. So, you know, again, if you read the, the, the ACORN legal briefing, it, I'm under the impression that there is still quite a lot of scope for municipalities to act. And that's where the gap needs to come in, right? And that's where the big difference can be made because Bill 97 is not going to do much. I mean, this is a government that, when they first came to power in 2018, got rid of some of the last pieces of rent control, right? Mm -hmm. So 
that's another big issue, big elephant in the room that this council is unable to do anything about because that is clearly a provincial jurisdiction, but there are things like these bylaws that, that cities have the power to, to act upon. And if they're not going to do it, no one else is. Councillor? Thank you very much for that. And I really wanted to just highlight something you said and then ask a final question, which was that the onus is on the tenant. And I would ask everyone listening to this conversation and the, the delegations that come forward to ask if we can be placing any more onus on these tenants. Um, my answer to that is no, by the way. Um, we can't be. Um, and so my last question is about rent evictions, period. Again, I think this term is really important to to distinguish between rent evictions and renovations. You wrote about that a bit in your article. I wonder if you just give us your take on that subject, because I think it's important to talk about why there's not actually rent evictions uh, legislation of any kind in Ontario. There's renovations and there's evictions law, but none on rent evictions. Doctor? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I mean, we, we don't have anything that matches the reality that's happening on the ground, the, the lived experience. Again, it comes back to my point about what kind of knowledge, what kind of information do you draw upon to make your policy, to make your laws. If you're drawing on primarily data sets and statistics, all of what you hear today simply doesn't exist. Right? And so it doesn't really reflect in the provincial laws that we have, and it also doesn't really reflect on the municipal bylaws and, and policies that we have. We're hearing this evidence. We are hearing this data. So it is real, right? You won't see it in the census. You won't see it in our laws. But we need to acknowledge that what we're hearing today needs to, with whatever power that you all have, um, needs to be reflected in the rules, the policies, the bylaws, that we have. Councillor. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time here, for your article, for answering these questions. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.